Welcome to the Word. This is Through the Word Thursday. Thank you for joining us at Through the Word Thursday here on the Word. We're going to get into a one of my favorite little pieces of scripture. Um, it's an interesting thing. It's the first capital campaign to raise money to build the tabernacle. It is a great story in all, and I believe that we're going to get a lot out of it. So I want you to um, to join me as we take a look at this, and it's through the word Thursday, building the tabernacle, the first capital campaign. Now this isn't going to be all about money. This is going to be about building God's place of meeting. It's a very important thing for the body of Christ. So we want you to enjoy the the lesson today. We want you to um, really get something out of it, and I believe it's going to change the way you think about a lot of things. So let's get on with our very first lesson here. Here we have our first piece of scripture out of Exodus 35, 1 through 3. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. Pretty stiff penalty there. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. Now, this is a very interesting thing because he puts it right at the beginning of building the tabernacle. He's going to give them instruction on what, what to do to build the tabernacle, collect for the tabernacle so they have enough of the materials that are needed. But he's also going to tell them before he does any of that, hey, listen, you work on this thing for six days, but on the Sabbath day, you're off. Under penalty of death, you're off. That should tell you something about what God believes about the, the overall structure of the church, of the body of Christ. It isn't about just doing things, you know, working your brains out and so on and so forth. It, it's about a whole lot more than that. In fact, it was so holy of a thing that you take the time to rest and break away from it that God gives them command under penalty of death to not do it. Uh, in the Mish, uh, Mishnah Shabbat 7.2, there's a list of 39 temple and tabernacle tasks or labors that had to be done. None of these were permitted on the Sabbath day. This tells you the, the, the day that God has set aside for worship, reflection of who He is, it's all about Him. It is not about our doing. It is not about the stuff that we do, the stuff that we think we ought to do or should do or have done. The Sabbath day is about worship. It's about relaxing and worshiping Him, recognizing all that He does in the universe, recognizing everything He does for us, recognizing all the goods and all the purposes that He has on this planet and His relationship with us. So many people make church like this task thing. It's not supposed to be a task thing. It is supposed to be a wonderful, beautiful thing that's enjoyed. And I'll be honest with you, just by knowing the dropping numbers in church attendance of, of, across all denominational lines, in the United States especially, we don't enjoy church. People don't enjoy church. Or when they go, they're looking for an entertainment thing. It's got to be something that catches their attention and holds them and all that that is not what any of this is about. What this is about when it comes to relationship of God with the meeting place of his people, because that's what the tabernacle is. It's the meeting place where he meets his people. When it comes to that, it is not about us. It is all about him. It is about worship. It is about us relaxing, kicking back and saying, okay, the Lord Jesus Christ finished it all for us. Now let's worship him. Let's appreciate him. Let's know him for who he is and honor Him, give Him glory. It should be a wonderful, fun time. It should be a time of honest worship. It should be a time when we're not all in, uh, you know, looking for what did the minister say wrong? What did this happen? We didn't like that song. We didn't, it was too hot. It was too cold. It shouldn't be about any of that. It should be about sitting back and relaxing, knowing the goodness of God. 
and worshiping him. I don't know why we made church such a, a chore. You know what I mean? It was so holy to the nation of Israel that God said, I don't care what you do the other six days. You, you work on this tabernacle then, but the seventh day you're resting. You're going to take some time off. Now, in, um, one of the things that the Mish Mishnah talks about is it's interesting enough is that the fire is expressly pointed out is being prohibited on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath day. Well, why fire? Why would he, why would he say, listen, there's not going to be any strange fire. You're not going to light any of your own fire on that day. You know, it's interesting because two guys actually got killed because they offered strange fire before the Lord. Nadab and Abihu. They were sons of the priests, and they decided they would offer up their own fire. You know, when we come together and gather together as a church, we are celebrating the creativity that God gave us. But it's His gift. It's the thing that He gave. And when they offer up strange fire, what God is saying is, the fire that is in you, the, the, the uh, enthusiasm, the, the, the satisfaction, the joy, the peace, everything that is in you, that fire of the Spirit in you is just that. It is the fire of the Spirit. It is not of your working. It is not of your thing. One of the things that uh, just irks me to no end is when I go to a church visiting or uh, even at our church and um, whoever is leading the worship, whether it's you know the, the normal person or somebody else, and they want to kind of gin up the congregation, get them excited, do songs and say things and you know, blast a song forever or whatever, just in order to get the congregation excited, to pump them up. Well, we're not there to be pumped up. The only fire that we ought to have built inside of us is from the Spirit. That's what this is saying. That's the reason why he prohibited fire. Because it's interesting that human beings are the only ones that can create fire. Animals can't create fire. Animals can breed. They can reproduce. Man, mankind can create through reproduction. We, we can have children. Animals can have children reproduce. Animals can't make fire. Plants can't make fire. Nothing can make fire out of nothing except for human beings. We can take two sticks. I had to do this in Cub Scouts when I was a kid. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. All of a sudden, you get a little puff of smoke, you know? And, and you can use a magnifying glass. Just have light and a magnifying glass. You can create fire. We're the only animals on the earth that can do that. It's representative of cleansing. Fire is. It says that we're going to be cleansed by his spirit. Right? It, it says the fire of the spirit is going to burn away all your dross and all the wood, hay, and stubble that's in your life. It's going to purify you. Fire is representative of the Spirit. So the Spirit is the fire inside of us that brings up all the joy, the, the um, long-suffering, the, the uh, patience, the kindness. The fire of the Spirit does all that in us. The fire of the Spirit is also the thing that cleanses us from the other stuff, from the stuff we shouldn't have in our life. God says, you're not going to make any fire on the Sabbath day. The day you come to worship me, it's not your fire, it's my fire. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? I mean, that, that is a good thing to think about. When you go to church on a Sunday morning, it's not your fire, it's his fire. It's not about you being pumped up, it's about God being pumped up. He's excited you're there to worship him. We can't cleanse ourselves. Only God can do the cleansing. It doesn't make any difference how much we attend church, how much we confess, how much we give penance, how much we give in an offering. We cannot cleanse ourselves. Only God can. It is his fire that cleanses. It is his fire that puts all the stuff that God is inside of us. That's the reason why we can worship. That's the reason why we can gather together. He, he's getting it already set up here for the tabernacle. In Exodus 35, 4-9, it says, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart 
Let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet, yarns, and fine twine linen, goat's hair, and tanned ram skins, and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastplate. He says, listen, if anybody's going to come and bring any of this stuff, God doesn't say, you're going to give this, you're going to give that, you're going to do it. I've seen people do that. I've seen the message of tithing preached to uh, the extreme of legalism. I even had heard preachers say, well-known preachers say, national preachers say, if you're not tithing, you're not even saved, you're not even born again. Well, none of you being born again has to do with how much money you give. It doesn't matter that you tithe or doesn't don't tithe when it comes to salvation. It does matter as to where your heart's at on what you give. You notice what he says here. All of you who have a generous heart, who have, whoever has a generous heart. I want to go to another scripture here because this is a pretty interesting scripture. Um, and, and he's given them a repeat list from... Exodus 25, 4 through 7, of, of what to uh, what to expect, what to bring, what's what should be involved in all of this. When God repeats something, we sh- we need to pay attention to it because God doesn't repeat things often. But when he repeats something, it's something he wants us to know. And it's important to him. He often makes his repetitions also in an order. When he gives a list, pretty generally that list is in an order. From most important to least important. Gold, silver, and bronze are used to represent value. They are the first things listed in this list. And he's saying if you have a generous heart, don't bring your junk. Bring gold, silver, and bronze as an offering to the Lord. Many times when we ask for, you know, donations either for, you know, like right now we're collecting coats for uh, the homeless people. Well, people will bring in the stuff that's worn out. The buttons are all missing. The zippers are broke. There's holes in it. The sleeves are ripped off just about. And they'll say, well, you know, we can't use it, so somebody else will use it. No, God's saying, listen, when you bring your stuff to the house of the Lord, when you're donating things, bring your best stuff. Bring your silver, your gold, your bronze. Those are all statements of value, as are the colored yarns and the materials that they're going to bring. All of that meant value. God isn't cheap. God is expensive. He has great taste. And the temple was a thing that, I mean, unbelievable in its making. I mean, it is literally, it is unbelievable in its making. We could not reproduce the temple in this day and age. We wouldn't have enough money. It would be, you know, it would be billions of dollars to rebuild the temple as it was then. So he says here, and I want to get you this verse from 1 Corinthians, what, what we're talking about, because this is New Testament now. This isn't talking Old Testament tithing. This is talking about New Testament. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. The work that anyone has built on the foundation survives. We will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You get the importance of the fire there? Get what God's doing with the fire? You get what what you're going to bring to the altar? Uh, When you go to make your offering before the Lord, you're going to bring your your gold, your silver, your brass, your your precious stones. You're going to bring the good things that aren't going to burn up. They're not going to be wood, hay, and stubble. He never asked for wood, hay, and stubble. He didn't ask you to bring your worst. He asked you to bring your best because he wants to bless you with his best because he wants to show off his best to you. And, and he says here, I, I love the w- way Paul talks about it when he's talking to uh, the churches. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. That's the reason why he says that. God wants a cheerful giver. 
he doesn't want you to give begrudgingly or if you don't have something you know well I guess God wants to take the last I have yeah we don't need any of the last you have God wants you to feel good and be a cheerful giver about what you bring whether it's to give it to the poor or it's to give it to the church or it's to give it to some ministry or to build the house of the Lord as these folks are doing God wants a cheerful giver because in that cheerful giver you are being blessed and there's a lot of faith that goes into it that faith that faith will overcome any financial mountain you have it will when you give with a cheerful heart and you give believing that the Lord is returning back to you he will he will not you will he will make men add to your bosom pressed down shaken together and running over that's his promise not my promise not some preacher on TV's promise that's the Lord's promise given it shall be given to you pressed down shaken together and running over and he and he wants you to be cheerful about that you're, the reason why you're cheerful about it is you understand who you're given to you understand what you're given to you understand that regardless of you know whether you like what they're building or you like what they're doing with the money or whatever you understand you're not giving it to the pastor in the pulpit you're not giving it to the you know the elder team or the trustees uh, some some people in in church you know if they're trustees or whatever sometimes they they act like they're uh, responsible for God's money they're not either what they need to do is receive it gladly and distribute it distribute it gladly and and so he says here in Exodus 35 this isn't just about money either this is about you this is about your skill level this is about the things the gifts that God put it has put inside of you he says let every skilled craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded he gave you skills talents and abilities so you could use them for the kingdom of God so you could use them to build the kingdom of God whether that's musically or it's with your hands building stuff you know listen the church needs roofers the church needs bricklayers the church needs electricians and plumbers the church needs people who are mathematicians that can figure things out the church needs people who who uh, are carpet cleaners the the church needs janitorial staff the the church needs uh, teachers and uh, coaches more or less the church needs all the gifts that you have inside of you the church needs it the body of Christ needs it that and God gave you those gifts so that you could use them for the edification of the body of Christ well I'm such a good you know this that and be, you know church doesn't need any of that church needs it all listen the body of Christ isn't just about you giving money to it and paying somebody else to do something it is about you being involved in using the gift and talent and ability that God put in you to edify the body of Christ, to build up somebody else, to build up part of the body of Christ. Maybe it is to build the physical presence or the physical building where people gather together. Maybe it's about putting together a sports team for your church. Maybe it's about uh, coming up with some, some music program or some outreach program or some other thing that you are being used for in order to build up, to edify, to enrich the body of Christ. And then when you use that gift, all the other things, all the other pieces your gift is used for, man, they get magnified as well. He says here, Exodus 35, 20 through 22, Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contributions to be used for the tent of meeting and for all of its services and for the, the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought uh, brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. These people got it. They understood the importance of having this meeting place with God. They understood it. So what they do? They brought their gold. 
They brought their brooches, they brought their, their earrings, their necklaces, their, their rings, their staffs that had gold in them. They brought all of that to the Lord. The Lord didn't compel them and tell them they were going to be punished if they didn't or they were going to lose something if they didn't. The Lord just said, hey, I, I need it. you got to bring it. I supplied it to you. Can you give it as an offering? Let's build this thing up and I'll meet with you some more. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. And that is key. That is really key. You being blessed, that is the key to it. You having a willing heart. I talk to people all the time. Well, I can't really afford to tithe. Well, no, you can't afford to tithe. And, and if I could put, if I wanted to put conviction on you, I, I, I could by saying, yeah, but you can't afford to buy King's Island ticket year, uh, season tickets to the Bengals. You can afford... Uh, season tickets to the Reds. You can afford to go to this show, that show, this thing, that thing. You can afford to have a whole closet full of clothes, but you can't afford the tithe. I wonder how that works out. You, you see, those are the conviction things, and we can pull that card out and we could say it, but that's not really what this is about. It isn't about you being convicted, because then you're not giving willingly. You are giving begrudgingly. You are thinking about the things you don't have or you're not going to be able to buy with what you're giving. That's not a willing heart. A willing heart is when you recognize the value, the value in the meeting place of God. You recognize the value that it's going to make to your life, that's going to make to your children's life and your children's children's life. For them to have a church body to come into, grow up in. If you don't have a church home, if you are a believer but you got mad, you know, because you you, you you love Christ but you hate his body or you're dissatisfied with his body or his body you think stinks they do too many wrong things they don't do what you want them to do you need to put that all aside honestly you do and you need to say yeah the church isn't perfect it's filled up with people just like you who are imperfect but I have something that I can contribute and maybe if I change my attitude I become a willful participant I become a joyous participant in building up this thing called the body of Christ. And I use my gifts, talents, and abilities in, in my finances to build up this body of Christ. Maybe all of this stuff will change. All the stuff I don't like will change. Well, you can't change some of the people. Sure you can. Go ask for their forgiveness if you offended them. If they offended you, go ask for your forgiveness. Ask them to forgive you. Fix it. Make it right. Enjoy it. Enjoy being with your fellow believers. That's what this whole thing is about. And that's what God is trying to say. You're not just coming here because, you know, you're not, it, it, this isn't just about coming and seeing me. This is about coming and seeing all the other people in the nation, is what he's saying to the nation of Israel. This is going to be a fun time because you're all going to be blessed by my presence. And that's really what church is about. It's about all of us being blessed by his presence. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6-8, it says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's starting to sound like a preacher there, right? Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God wants you blessed. He wants you blessed abundantly above all that you're able to ask or to think. The reason why he wants you blessed that way is so that you will be able to give when you're called upon to give. This is what he did with the children of Israel when they left Egypt. He loaded them down. The Bible says he loaded them down with precious jewels and uh, gemstones and gold and silver and bronze. He loaded them down with materials, uh, purples and blues and scarlet, uh, yarns and linens. He did all of that with all of that precious stuff so that they would be able to give with willing hearts when the time came to establish a meeting place with them. Because that's God's primary thing, to meet with man. To meet and be a friend with man. To be in the presence of man. Exodus 35, 29, it says, All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses, 
to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. It was not by compulsion. It was not something that they were forced to do. He goes on to say, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. God prepares those that have, that he's given the gifts, he's prepared you to do the work. Your gift, no matter how small you think it may be, God has prepared you to do that. He's already set you up. And Bezalel's really set up. This guy's a gifted craftsman. Like I said, you couldn't rebuild the tabernacle in the wilderness. You couldn't do it today. It cost you too much money. You couldn't rebuild the temple today. It would cost too much money. He goes on to say, He has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every work, sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine linen. And by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So he said, hey, these guys know how to do all this stuff. They're going to be great supervisors. They're going to take your skill, talent, and ability, and they're going to mold it, and they're going to change it so that you do something amazing with it. That's the body of Christ. That's the church. That's how this thing should work. You bring your stuff into the temple, into the house of God. God has people there already that know how to extract your skills, talents, and abilities and put them to work. Well, all they want me to do is, is work for them. Yes! Because you hone your skills, you practice your skills there, you put them before the Lord, and just like your money, the Lord returns it back to you 30, 60, and 100 fold. The Lord returns back to you promotion on your job. The Lord returns back to you the opening and, and furtherment of your company. Maybe maybe you start your own business because of the skills you, you honed while you were working on a church. If, if it was painting or carpentry work or plumbing or whatever. And you prosper abundantly above all you were able to ask or to think. Maybe you're a mechanic and you work on cars. Well, get working on the church vans, the church buses, and the preacher's car. Get working on all them. Don't do it begrudgingly, but look at it joyfully. Practice your skills. Maybe there's other jobs connected to that job. Good, high-paying things that come into your hands as a result of it. God has designed this thing for us to succeed, not to fail, for us to be blessed, not fall on our faces and hate it. He says he has inspired him to teach. So he was inspired to teach. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, this is New Testament, book of Ephesians. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all, all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what he did for us. That's what he put in us. He put all of that in us so that we, we, as servants of the Lord, could be blessed in everything. That's our lesson for, for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Please read through that 35th chapter, man. It's, it's, it's a great chapter. If you've been discouraged about going to church and being used or you think people are using you for your skills, they are. God wants to use your skills. That chapter will encourage you to get involved. It'll encourage you to do more in the body of Christ. It'll encourage you to do for others within the body of Christ using your skills, talents, and abilities that God's given you. Listen, you're blessed abundantly above all you're able to ask or to think. Take that knowledge with you today. Be blessed in everything you do in Jesus' mighty name. He loves you, he's called you, and he's gifted you and nobody's left out. Blessings until next week.